Welcome to Jewish Cinematheque, where we meet some of the important faces involved with films that tackle aspects of the Jewish experience. Today we meet documentary filmmaker Oren Rudofsky, whose film Joseph Pulitzer, Voice of the People, explores the importance of a free press in America and the man who helped forge American investigative journalism. Oren, welcome to Jewish Cinematheque. Thanks for having me. So I have been following your career for a couple of decades now. You're one of those few individuals who decided at a certain point in time that you wanted to focus a great deal, not all, but a great deal of your work on Jewish-oriented subjects. Uh, you know, <laughs> tell me a little bit about that. I mean, what's your background and why did you decide to pursue and really make some groundbreaking films? Uh, I don't know if becoming a Jewish filmmaker was anything I decided, actually. But I do think it, it obviously is in my DNA. It's in my blood. So when I uh, look at stories out there, I find that I am interested in, in, in Jewish topics. Um, and not just interested, but can become obsessed with them. Um, and by the way, I didn't consider Joseph Pulitzer, Voice of the People, to be in that category of Jewish films, but I have since found out that the, the general public does consider it to be one of, of those as well, and, and I understand why, of course. Why? Why? Let's just why? interrupt you in the middle. <laughs> um, well, because, um, well, Joseph Pulitzer was an immigrant, and American Jewish stories are often immigrant stories, um, because he was born Jewish, and um, because I think for me, at least, his progressive politics uh, come from a Jewish place, as, as I think my progressive politics come from a Jewish place. So I, I, think, I think that's what makes audiences feel like it's, uh, you know, uh, why it's played in any number of Jewish film festivals alongside uh, just regular film festivals, and why I'm here. <laughs> but what you do focus in a great deal is his, here he was probably the most prominent newspaper guy in, in, in the world. Uh, and yet you often talk about throughout the film his outsider status. So can you elaborate a little bit on that? You know, was it because he was a Jew, because he spoke with an accent, because he was an immigrant? Yeah, I, I think it's a combination of all of those. And I think, um, you know, as, as a Jew, he um, was caricatured many times in the press, and, and people called him Joseph Julitzer, Joseph Pulitzer, and other worse terms. Um, and people held it against him, uh, uh, that against him that he wasn't Jewish enough, against him that he was too Jewish, um, even though he wasn't too Jewish. Uh, they, they caricatured him with a large knows and if you look at photos he he doesn't particularly have you know he you might say is a prominent nose but not you know not caricature obvious um, and I think uh, politically he he took he took down people he considered to be um, uh, to have done things that he found to be inappropriate or illegal or or, or the the rest of it without you know, so people were angry at him, and they used everything they could against him. So I don't know if that quite answers your question. No, it does. But, it does. Yeah. But it, so in a certain sense, that's what made him a little bit of a hero for you? Well, you know, what, what he's made not, him... He's not a straight, you know, he's, he's there, there. You very clearly show both sides. Of, even there's a great moment where you see a, a painting of him, and you talk about the two sides of Joseph Pulitzer. Yeah, well, he was, he was painted by uh, John Singer Sargent. In terms of his character, uh, that Sargent portrait is, is fascinating because uh, you can see by this time in his life he had, he had lost sight completely in one eye and mostly in the other. And, uh, and one of his secretaries who was sitting there when Sargent finished his painting uh, made the point, which we do in the film, if you cover one half the face, he looks like a benevolent elderly man, and if you cover the other, he looks 
like a sinister Mephisto. Um, and he was a difficult guy, but you know, wh what makes him heroic to me is that first as an immigrant, he comes to the States and he sets out to uh, become a, a newsman and he, he's successful. He's obviously brilliant, if not a genius. He learns English very well. He works day and night um, and, uh, and he establishes uh, the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, one of the great papers which stays in the family's hands for over 120, 126 years, I think it is, till 2005 and stays progressive. That to me makes him a hero that the family and subsequent generations maintain that perspective. Progressive in, in Missouri. Progressive in Missouri, yeah. And in, in, um, in New York, where he establishes the world, uh, he is a hero to immigrants. Why? He, because he writes about them. And simply writing about immigrants and not just high society makes him, makes him a hero. But not only does he write about them, he, he tries to put in the paper things that are going to help them be American. He teaches them how to be good Americans. And, and then, uh, you know, so all, all of this, well, well, and then he goes blind. And even though he is slowly going blind, he has detached retinas, which in the 1890s, there was no cure for until the 1920s. Um, so the last 20 years of his life, he was beset with all these medical programs, some pr problems, something called neurasthenia, which was a nervous ailment that was considered one that, that hit the rich and, and the urban. And he fought against these throughout his life. And even when he couldn't see, he had secretaries reading to him from the paper. And he would, he would voluminously be in touch with his staff with telegrams from wherever he was to maintain control of what was going on in the paper. You showed how this Jewish immigrant from Hungary, comes penniless pretty much to America, creates probably the, the, lar the newspaper with the largest circulation, what, in the world or at least in America? Well, I, I, uh, I believe the world. I and it was the called world. the world. Yes. And then you show the contrast between this Jewish immigrant who came up and just, you know, found the American dream and Randolph, you know, and, and Hearst, yeah. who comes from, you know, wealth and, and can you just talk about the contrast between the two? <laughs> well, uh, clearly, uh, William Randolph Hearst, his, his father made a great fortune uh, in silver mining and, and started the San Francisco Examiner. And Hearst was, went to Harvard, uh, though he didn't do much studying there, apparently. Um, in those days, if you were wealthy, it was easy to get into these schools, and apparently these days as well. <laughs> it seems to be an ongoing uh, issue. Or not so easy. <laughs> Maybe it costs more now. But, um, but, uh, so, but Hearst admired Pulitzer, and he read The World, and you know, he was in Boston, but The World had circulation, uh, amazingly enough, it, it had circulation across the country. I don't know how much time it took to get the press, but they had it. And he admired the style of the paper, and he wanted to emulate it. And he got his uh, father and mother to uh, give him quite a fortune to start a newspaper in, in New York. And, uh, and then, uh, basically, he and, he and Pulitzer were fighting for the same audience because Hearst not only stole many of his editors and in, in fact, his, his first cartoonist, Utkult, uh, who did uh, a cartoon, the first cartoon in the paper is called The Yellow Kid, he took him to his paper. So, uh, so they were in, in real competition. And, uh, you know, they were both clearly very good at what they did and cutthroat in what they did and knew how to reach their audience. So they had a lot in common, but... Hearst was a more, more conservative and became increasingly more conservative as he got older. Progressive versus conservative. They still, however, you know, during the Spanish-American War, 
they still both, Hearst started and Hearst sort of, and Pulitzer got on the bandwagon uh, after the main blew up. One of the things that you deal with, I think, magnificently is, is how uh, Pulitzer was involved and Hearst also in, in effect, moving America towards war uh, against Spain. Um, and, and we know from history that, you know, maybe the battleship Maine was not necessarily sunk by a torpedo. Can you just talk about the role of journalism and, and war in this case? Well, Roosevelt, Teddy Which, Roosevelt was the president, and we can't, we can't leave him out of this, really. Um, and, you know, newspapers, as we know from our own times, you know, and things like the Gulf of Tonkin Revolution, resolution or, or the debate over the Iraq war, that newspapers clearly and obviously TV and, and all the other media now play, play, a, play a big role in public opinion and in shaping public opinion. But in the end, let's remember it's, it's politicians, it's presidents, it's senators and the Congress who actually make decisions about what's going to happen. And, and you know, one of, one of the challenges in making this film or, or thinking about uh, journalism in the media is, is asking that question, to what degree do newspapers truly uh, affect policy? But, but certainly during the Spanish-American War, uh, Hearst went out of his way immediately when the Battleship Maine was, was blown up by uh, possibly a torpedo, but much more likely some, some munitions in the, in the ship or some, so some mine or something, who knows who placed it, hitting it, and many lives were lost, and played a role in, in suggesting that it was the Spanish, the dastardly Spanish, who did it. And uh, Pulitzer's paper tried to hold back in touting that same perspective on it. But very quickly, they saw that they were losing the circulation battle. And who, who knows the reasons or the rationale? But they did join in in that. And it's something, and, and, and the march to war was, you can see it in the newspapers, and there's a segment of the film where you see all those ma massive headlines. And they, they published uh, multiple editions of the paper every day with new stories. They were spending thousands of dollars in, in telegram charges in those days. They, they, they sent over their, their newsmen. So they, they put a lot of money in this. And the question is, why were they doing this? Was it to sell newspapers? Or was it to keep us abreast of the news? Or was it a combination of the two? And one has to remember that newspapers are a business. And they're, they're, they're there not just to be truth tellers uh, and accurate about the news, but they're there to sell newspapers. Throughout the film, and this is a very interesting approach to filmmaking, you bring us to the present. I mean, even to the point where you just have people on the street and you'll look at a building from the, from the 19th century and suddenly we're in the 21st century. Uh, newspapers today, it seems that they're far and fewer and they, you know, in a situation where you have the politicians and you have the newspapers, were you trying to make a, a, a statement through that? De definitely. <laughs> <laughs> definitely trying to make a statement. I mean, uh, we, we, and it's not just newspapers, of course, it's all media. So, so we have, you know, shots uh, from back then of people on the subway and elsewhere all reading their newspapers. And there were many newspapers at that time and we shift to the subway where people are using their cell phones to, to see newspaper headlines as well. So um, yes, and, and obviously the, the role of journalism in, in, in our world is the same as it was back then, but also Pulitzer's way of, of telling stories and, and, and news it w was revolutionary, I think, and is the same way stories are, are told now. I mean, he was very visual in his presentation. He kept uh, the s stories alive day after day in the newspaper. He had these crusades, which he did, where, 
where the, the Statue of Liberty, for example, uh, didn't have a pedestal, and he, he did a fund, uh, crowdfunding campaign. Way ahead of his time. Way ahead of his time, and that was both, both to provide the funds for the uh, platform on which the Statue of Liberty now sits, but also as a way to involve uh, his readers, so they, they would print the names of everybody who gave money in the newspaper, and that was whether they gave a penny, a quarter, or, or whatever, and he specifically pitched this to his immigrant audience. So, you know, so the past and the present, I think, are the same. Uh, I don't know who said, you know, there is no past. <laughs> anyway, I can't quote that one. But um, uh, things have not changed as dramatically as one would think. Um, after the Spanish-American War, Pulitzer does use the newspaper to, again, push his progressive uh, ideas and, and what he considers to be the fundamental uh, aspect of what America is. He pushes against colonialism. I mean, America has now acquired these territories as a result of the war, and he's not happy with that. Um, so his politics, what about that? Well, you know, uh, he's not entirely consistent. Uh, I, I did just want to add that after the Spanish-American War and after his paper sort of joined in with the hue and cry for war, that he did regret that. And he did, he did and I believe that some of the uh, institutions that are funded in his will, uh, including the Pulitzer Prizes and including the Columbia School of Journalism, which he funded, were out of a sense of mission that professionalizing the news was important and rewarding uh, great news stories. And I think the Pulitzer Prizes in, in and of themselves, and I think newspapers in and of themselves, uh, lean towards uh, exposing corruption and exposing wrongdoing. And one of his last battles was against Teddy Roosevelt, who he had a longstanding feud with from the time Roosevelt was police commissioner in New York. but. Um, he, uh, he took him on, on on some funding, $40 million of funding, that uh, they couldn't figure out where it went in the building of the Panama Canal. The, pa the Panama ca Canal story is complicated, but uh, you know, it was first a French uh, company's uh, idea to build a canal, and they were going to do it through Nicaragua, and there were problems with that. And basically what happened is the US decided uh, to help some Panamanian, there was no Panama at the time, they, there was a revolt that was supported by US warships that were just off the coast. And uh, the, the nation of Panama was created, and you know this isn't the beginning of American interference in Latin America, nor is it the end of it. We see um, it today, right. <laughs> so, but there, there, um, the Panama Canal became a country and allowed U.S. interests, now U.S. interests, to build a canal. But there was already money that had been set aside. And Pulitzer not only was critical of that land grab, but also was exploring what happened to that $40 million. And this is a case that went through the newspapers for several years. It kept getting picked up. And I think it drove Teddy Roosevelt nuts. And at a certain point, there was an article in the paper that he thought went over a line. And he wrote this letter uh, to Congress, which He is, meaning Teddy. Teddy wrote a letter to Congress that was incredibly <laughs> vilifying of Pulitzer personally and threatened to put him in jail. So and, the President of the United States is publicly coming out against an, a, a journalist saying that he should be jailed for is expression of free press. Yes, well, is, is this something new? Um, <laughs> this, happens, this happens frequently, not just with Republicans or Democrats. It, it, it happens. And, uh, and Teddy felt like no newspaper should, should do this to the President of the United States. And he, he wanted uh, Pulitzer, Pulitzer to be charged with criminal libel uh, there is no such thing in the federal uh, legal system as, as criminal so law. So Teddy just made up this. And he, and he forced his attorney general to 
somehow bring the case to the Supreme Court. And, it, and, and the case really didn't, didn't seem to have legs to stand on, but it, it went through the courts. And in the end, Pul Pulitzer was, was cleared of all, uh, all charges. I mean, Pulitzer's first instinct was to run on his boat, actually. Really? Just and, to Yeah. But in the end, he stood his ground. And the letter he wrote ab about uh, this in an editorial is very powerful about not muzzling the press and the freedom of the press and that he'll stand up to it and he'll go to jail if he has to. I think that's one of the, the, the most important elements of this film. I mean, here's a guy who was an immigrant and yet he, freedom of the press. You know, it's so essential to any democracy. Well, Pulitzer, there's a stamp that was published and it says our a US, postage, a US stamp. postage stamp many years ago that said our republic, that's a quote of Pulitzer's, our republic and its press will rise or fall together. And I do believe that's true, that we need a free press to tell us, to try to tell us what the truth is. And they, they don't always get it right, but that's, I believe, what they're, what, what they're trying to do for us, the American people. Powerful. Or in your list of credits are just, you know, extraordinary. Um, either making films on your own or with other filmmakers. Uh, films like uh, A Life Apart, Hasidism in America, which was, as I remember, one of the first films to really explore um, the Hasidic community uh, in, in, in the States. Uh, powerful. A film that you made with Menachem Down. Uh, another film that you made with Menachem, uh, The Ruins of Lifta. Um, you've dealt with Holocaust survivors, you've dealt with Hasidism, you've dealt with Jews in Eastern Europe. Uh, at the Crossroads, a film you made, Jews in Eastern Europe with, with Yale Strom. So, and, and most recently, you uh, helped create uh, a bank of films for the Moscow um, Jewish Museum uh, and, and Tolerance Center. Uh, so, I, I, and I must say, I'm, I'm just so impressed by all of your work. And, and you manage here in the story of Joseph Pulitzer, who I had no idea was even Jewish, to bring in that Jewish flavor that is so much a part uh, of, uh, of American, the American Jewish experience. So thank you so much for everything you do, and we look forward to inviting you back for your next film. Appreciate thank your being with us. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double chai, or more. Simply visit the JBS website at jbstv.org and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please, indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check to JBS, P.O. Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.